Hey guys, it's Dave with OC Astronomy. I'm here with my brand new MIT telescope and I have a problem to report. Um, I tried to do my first or a, a, a good imaging session. I got everything set up, I got everything uh, running, um, I got the auto guider connected, I got my cameras connected, and I started doing some imaging of the ring nebula. And as it was going, uh, on a cycle of about five minutes or so, I was getting a really weird sudden movement in the RA. Uh, it would, it would uh, spike up for a couple of arc seconds and then immediately come back down and then it would center out again and the guiding corrections would work for a while and then it would shoot up and then it would shoot back down and then it would come back to the middle. And uh, if you look at my guiding uh, output on the graph, it looked like a cardiogram for a heartbeat and with a nice steady rhythm at four and a half, five minutes. And so I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna do a diagnostic here. I'm gonna, uh, they want me to take a uh, log of a star, um, like lock, lock in my camera on a, on a star and watch it over the course of a few minutes. Um, the thing is, in order to do that, I, I can't have too much drift in my RA and deck, so I'm going to have to get a lot better polar alignment, so I'm going to have to do a really good polar alignment, do a drift alignment, and then I can take this log. Otherwise, as it goes, my star will drift out of the screen, and that won't work for the log. So I'm going to have to do all that just to figure out what's causing that weird spike. The truth is I'm really kind of upset. Um, I spent the money on this mount to avoid this problem because my CGX mount was giving me star trails also. Uh, the problem that it had was that its worm block was sticking. It was uh, uh, it had some stiction issue with the bearing. I don't think the bearing on this would have the same issue, but I can't believe that I have a problem straight out of the box with this. I did, I did my best to set up a T-point model uh, to balance the scope. I have the scope really well balanced but just a little bit heavy on the counterweight side just barely so that it uh, has something for the RA to push against. I have about 103 pounds and this uh, and that includes the scope, the camera, the all of the counterweights here and the counterweights there. My total is about 103 pounds and the spec is 100. So I would expect I don't expect that jump of you know four or five arc seconds one direction and two or three the other direction and then for it to stabilize. Um, the movement is so sudden that my auto guider can't keep up with it and so I don't know I'm really frustrated but I'm gonna do the uh, the log that they want me to do the tracking log I'll send it into them see if they can diagnose it. Um, I know BISC has a very good reputation the MIT has a very good reputation um, I guess I'll get to see if the customer experience is any better with BISC or with CGX. I know the Celestron mount, they did not help me much. They said to just pack it up, send it in. Then they sent me back another uh, a mount that had the same issue. And so I want to see, I guess, uh, if maybe that's where the money is well spent is in customer service. So um, anyway, hopefully this diagnostic will show what's going on and Software Bisco helped me, you know, make it right and make the mount work right. Um, I was just really hoping to get straight to the imaging. Um, hopefully that'll happen soon. Okay, so the one of the first things they said to do uh, on this troubleshooting was to exercise the mount. So under the telescope um, tools menu over here, there's uh, there's Bisc TCS and uh, under the BIS TCS utilities is exercise the mount and so it's going to uh, go back and forth by its slew limits it'll move it back and forth between its limits and uh, and work the gears back and forth and that may you know move anything loose that may be stuck in between the teeth that might be causing that little jump okay so the next step they said to do in the process was to um, to get your position angle close to zero, and that's because they want to make sure that it's not drifting through the uh, the field of view. 
So I've got it pretty close now. I think I'm narrowing in on uh, 360 or zero. So here's my position angle. It's uh, 359 degrees and 32 uh, minutes. So I'm going to say that that's good. It said to get it within about a degree and that's within a degree. So I'm going to use my main camera to, to gather this data and I'm going to calibrate it on the auto guider. Um, uh, it'll come up and show me my uh, left and right up and down. Uh, it looks like my X and minus is right ascension is right on the money. And so I think minus any backlash from this having to change direction suddenly to do this calibration, um, I think that I'm going to be good. So, okay, so uh, the next step is to, uh, I'm going to drift align the scope and make sure that I can get the, uh, I want the track box, I want the star to stay in the track box. And right now my polar alignment, I need to get it on so that it stays in the track box. Hey, this is following up after Software Bisque had me do a, a star tracking test. Um, and they wound up agreeing that um, they needed to send me a new worm block. And so they did. And that was all of three or four days ago. And they got it to me. Uh, and I have a, a clear blue sky tonight. So I'm going to install it and repeat the test and uh, verify um, that the problem that I was having was that the, um, the worm uh, wasn't within spec for how high the peak to peak variation was on the periodic error. And so I wanted to kind of do a quick side note uh, out of the dome and explain that at the whiteboard. Let's see. Um, the test that they had me to do was to monitor a star and it started out uh, in the center of the track box, the, the uh, black box representing the track box. And it started out in that track box uh, and it, I watched it go one way, then back the other way, and one way and back the other way over the course of about 20 minutes. And it eventually got to the edge of the box and drifted out of the box or right to the edge of it and I, and I stopped the test. Um, and in that time I'd collected a couple of periods of the, of the worm oscillations um, and that was without any correction. So it was just watching the star and watching what it did and not making any corrections but just gathering the raw curve. And then I went in to the, uh, the PEC uh, tool that they have in the utilities and, had it, and plotted it and you could tell from the plot that that was where the problem was, I believe. So I just wanted to show here, their spec is for uh, a peak to peak variation in the, in the oscillation of that worm gear of seven arc seconds. And the red line uh, is showing an oscillation that is between those, that peak. So, or between those, the, the peak to peak. So you would have a motion up and then back down and then it would repeat and then you'd have the same motion again and that would be from your, uh, your periodic error in your worm gear. What mine was doing was right at the start uh, or at one point in the cycle, it was, it was making an excursion that was a little bit higher than that and then coming back down and, and oscillating around the middle and then going down and back up again and, and this was exactly the problem. Um, it, one, it was higher than seven, uh, P, uh, their spec said, which is not that bad. You could probably train that pet curve and it would reduce it quite a lot. Um, although the pet curve that they wanted me to put it, or that the program fit to it, uh, it only fit it to there and, and it, and it, it kind of, didn't cover all of this motion um, and and I think that it's because in the cycle of, of how far they want that to go it would have been too much and so what you're left over with is um, this part of it from here to here was the culprit it was changing from far on the negative side to far on the plus side and then coming back down and it was doing it so fast that the auto guider couldn't correct for it. And maybe if I had programmed this curve in, um, between the pet curve and guiding, it would have been able to keep up with the motion of that star. But it was this kind of quick over the course of, over a course of a couple of frames, um, that was what was causing 
my star motion to move too much. And so, um, credit to Software Bisque, they said that yes, uh, that is a little bit out of spec. It wasn't a lot out. Like, I, th I think the total was like nine arc seconds peak to peak, and the spec was seven. And so, that's not a huge number. Um, but the trouble is that it was doing it so quickly on that one part of it. If it had done something like this, where it had gone up above and then rotated back down and then, then gone up like so, and if, if that was your, was your curve, then this, this motion would be slow enough that a peck recording could easily counteract that kind of a motion and get you, you know, recover it. And it would still exceed the spec, but it would be, uh, you, could, you could handle it. But the fact that it was doing it so sharply made it where I couldn't correct for it with guiding, uh, and, I, and, I, and the pet curve that it wanted to do couldn't correct for all of it either. So credit to Software Bisque. They saw the log that I sent in. They said, yes, this is out of spec, and so we will replace it. And within uh, a day, they verified it, and they sent me uh, the new worm gear, very nicely packed, um, and they uh, provided me the return shipping instructions on what to do. So I'm going to remove this worm gear and then use the same box uh, and put the next worm block or the old worm block in this box and ship it back to them. Uh, and that'll be covered under warranty and it'll be, you know, a free repair. So I wanted to explain what was going on. I will try to roll in some actual pictures of the tracking log uh, and the PEC uh, curve analysis, but that's what to look for. Uh, underneath that curve, it shows the raw data, and I'll try and point that out. But the raw data uh, was exceeding the spec, and SoftwareBIS stood by their spec, and they sent me a replacement part uh, and did it quickly. So I guess that is the real uh, proof of, uh, of what you want to get for your money if you're paying for a more expensive mount. You are paying for recognizing the problem helping you troubleshoot it, giving you clear instructions on how to troubleshoot it, uh, giving you a plan of action on what to do to, to fix it, sending you the spare part and giving you, you know, communication throughout that whole process. And yeah, not every part that's manufactured is gonna be perfect. And, but the, the fact is that Software Bisque was able to communicate with me and, and not, you know, not tell me I was stupid uh, and not treat a customer as a nobody, but treat them as somebody that, okay, well, please conduct this test. And based on the outcome of that test, we'll determine where to go next. And in the troubleshooting tree, that's what, you know, that's where they found the problem. This part is out of spec, we'll replace it. Here you go, send us back to the old part. And that is awesome, frankly. It's a, quite a change from a mass market company to a company that understands its customer base, I think, a little bit better and understands their customers can carry out some of these troubleshooting functions and help identify the problem and correct it. So I'm going to go up in the dome now and install the new part. I'm going to repeat the star test, make sure that my new uh, PEC curve is within tolerance and uh, ship them back the old part. And hopefully I'll get back uh, straight to the imaging uh, and be able to get good, uh, get good subframes from it. So. All right, clear skies, everybody.